This is the first lecture in the third chapter of the Human Growth and Development. Um, your textbook calls it, oh, sure enough, it calls it Forming a New Life. I have in front of me the textbook and the chapter outlines. Um, and the reason I'm pointing that out is, is if you're trying to follow the textbook, it's not, the slides don't go exactly um, in the same sequence as the, um, as the textbook. And I'll try to point that out. This is the topic, or this is the chapter where we get to talk about um, conception and the role of heredity in genes. And for our purposes, we'll have a fairly broad stroke. You can make a whole career out of studying genetics, uh, which is pretty cool, but that's, we're not gonna go down that road necessarily. So this discussion or this topic, let me move that, this topic is what we call uh, genotype or environmental interaction, otherwise known as behavioral genetics. Um, how do genetics behave? And the, the fine tuning or the deeper understanding of the relationship between genes and the environment. Um, heritability, so there's so just let's go through some words here. Um, heritability um, is the term given to how much of a characteristic is shared within a group. So like maybe eye color, right? Eye color or hair color. That would be highly hereditary if a lot of people in the same group happen to have that characteristic. So it just suggests how much of certain traits, human traits, can you inherit um, or how much of them are sort of are, are caused by the environment. There are different ways, and we kind of hinted at some of this stuff in a previous lecture, there are different strategies for how researchers attempt to tease out the distinction between the nature and the nurture, how they attempt to tease out what human traits are uh, grounded in biology or biologically determined and which ones are environmentally influenced. Um, some of those would be family studies, adoption studies, or twin studies. I'm gonna start at the bottom because those are the those would be the best, would be twin studies, and those would be two, those would be, would be identical, genetically identical twins, not twins who are fraternal, not the phenomena of you have two eggs that fertilize at the same time, but a twin that was, and we'll talk about that on another slide, but a twin that was actually um, twins that were the product of the same egg splitting in two and growing two identical twins. If you could, if, in cases where you have two genetically identifiable uh, um, twins, and especially if they're separated at birth. Now, you don't want to do that because that's not really a very nice thing to do, but in that case, you could truly tease out what traits they have in common based on their genes or shared genetics and what traits are different based on their different environments. Um, adoption studies, are kind of sort of the same thing because the assumption is is that people who are in the same biological family they share a certain percentage of the same traits and so if a child is uh, maybe has a sibling what I always like to tell my kids is that I have two children and that my kids have more in common genetically with each other than anyone else in the family right so my daughter has half my genes my son has half my genes um, and I have nothing in common with my husband, but together they have more, more genetic um, material in common. And then family studies are just a little bit less rigorous in terms of what we can tease out. Um, but that's how social, that's how um, developmental psychologists do the bulk of their research and their conclusions. Now this next, these next ideas down here um, are actually pretty important and I'll probably create an activity where I ask you to consider or a discussion post where I asked you to consider the difference between what's called a passive correlation, a reactive, and an active or niche picking. The idea here is that all three of these, um, these terms, these concepts, uh, are different ways of describing the relationship between one's genetic inheritance and the role or the relationship of the environment. Right? What, how does the environment affect your genetic inheritance? Let me try to explain that better by explaining what it is. So passive correlation, as you can kind of read it there, passive correlation suggests that a person is born, a child is born with a genetic tendency, in this case, I only use that they're, they have the genetic 
predisposition to be a musician, right? That they have a certain connection, neural connections, the certain ability to hear tones, the certain um, motor dexterity, that they could become a really great musician. Some people don't have that genetic. Um, but what is, the what is the role of the environment? In a passive correlation, a child develops their outstanding um, music, musical ability because in addition to their, into their, to their genetically environmental um, inherited capacity, they're in an environment where it's also encouraged. Maybe I think you know a friend of mine from church, right? Everybody in their family plays an instrument and dad plays multiple instruments. They play instruments for fun instead of watching TV. They travel and perform in, um, as a family concert, as a family band, right? The passive correlation would suggest, well, of course, these people are going to develop good music skills because the environment is encouraging them to develop what they've naturally or biologically inherited, right? So that would be the most, um, yeah, the reactive or e what does it say evocative um, correlation suggests that a child a person is born with the same biological genetic capacity to become a good musician but the parents while it's not necessarily in the environment right it's not just part of the air that they breathe um, the parents do give create opportunities so in this case Maybe they have this natural tendency to be a musician and it's just part of their family culture that every child gets music lessons, right? So the parents have created an opportunity, but they're not going to go home and have mu music play. It's not going to be just part of their family, their household culture. They're not doing a lot. Only the kids get music lessons, right? We encourage them to practice, but that's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity. And then the third one, which is niche picking. This one suggests that the environment really doesn't do anything to encourage the promotion of these genetic abilities. Rather, the person themselves, the child themselves, creates, um, finds opportunities. So they realize that they're interested in music, and so they go to college and they take um, a music class, or maybe they major in music, right? So it's the idea that the participant, the individual, actively seeks out that environment. So what I like to ask students together, if we were in the same space together, is to think about things in your life that maybe would match each, ones of, each one of these, right? I can use myself, I'll use my, an, an example. Um, one would be, say, a, um, a passive correlation. So in my house, we have thousands of books because I inherited my father's collection. I mean, the bookshelves, my decorations are bookshelves, just floor to ceiling, there's just thousands of books. And so if one of my child, children would grow up to be an avid reader, you could argue that that was because they just lived in this environment and it encouraged reading because there were books everywhere. In this case, they actually didn't, so it's not a very good example. Reactive, niche, or when a child, uh, when the parents create an environment, I'll just use my kids again. Uh, my daughter happens to be, um, or she was, she was a gymnast. I, mean, I think I mentioned that before when she, no, that was another class. She got a concussion being a cheerleader. And none of us are athletes. My husband is not, my son is not an athlete. She, when she was born, like she walked at nine months. And I can remember like she was so strong. She just has this natural biological strength. Her little, her little toddler legs were just like sausages, you know? Um, so she naturally had this physical ability and strength, but the environment didn't give her opportunities to develop that, but we did create opportunities. Like I enrolled her in gymnastics when she was three and she tumbled up until she was out of high school, up until she was 18 years old. So she, it, that's an example of reactive, right? That, the, the, that we created the opportunity for her to develop um, a trait that she was naturally inclined to have. Niche picking it would be an example of, and I can't think of any good examples of niche picking um, in my personal life, but it might be an example of a child who, well, I guess I can think of one example. Um, a, a, a family I know, they were both in wheelchairs 
and they adopted a son, they adopted a little boy, and he went on to play football, right? I mean, obviously the parents are not going to, that's not a good example, but the parents didn't create an environment that encouraged it. Um, I guess maybe if they signed them up, but say he goes off to college or something. Uh, yeah, but, but the idea, I think, ho hopefully I'm making some sense, um, but the idea is that you, that a person has that genetic ability, but it's not until they have the opportunity that they make the opportunity themselves. I'm trying to think of a better, maybe a better example would be, except that one doesn't have, I was thinking that you grew up in a home where there's no faith tradition and you become a minister, but that's not really the best example either because the assumption is, is you have some sort of biological. So I'm gonna sort of stop it. Oh, no, a couple other things I wanna point out. Your textbook, does make reference it talks about uh it talks about this idea this genetic this genetic behavioralism over on page over on page like 65 64 and 65 um, and it goes on to offer a couple examples of characteristics that have um, that are known to have an environment and a genetic pre um, a genetic correlation one, they talk about obesity, intelligence, and temperament, and schizophrenia. Well, let's think about obesity, right? Obesity would be uh, people are, are born pro, uh, biologically prone to obesity, but how do you explain um, if, say, your parents are obese, but the child is not? Well, one could argue that the parents didn't allow the children to eat the same kinds of, well, um, that's, that's the example I'm used to my mom. My mom didn't want me to grow up to fight weight the same way she did. So she was more sensitive to what she fed me when I was a child. She continues to struggle with weight. I'm not like her. I certainly don't struggle like she does. Intelligence would be an example. Actually, intelligence is a really good example. And it suggests that we are born, right? Our brain, the number of folds, the grooves and folds in our brain, you need more surface area to have more neural connections. So you biologically inherit the brain systems that enable you to learn. But if you're kept in a, in a I was gonna say cage, if you're kept in a crib or you're, uh, all your parents ever do is set you in front of the television and people don't talk to you, then you're not going to develop that natural biological um, tendency right? How would that be an example of that your parents create and be reactive? Do they create an opportunity for you to express your intelligence? Or maybe you live in a home where there are no television. Well, I'm not suggesting that television is bad, but where people read and talk all the time. There's all these, and you go to museums for fun, right? That would be a passive correlation. Or maybe you didn't start reading until you, till you moved out of your house, and you didn't go to college till you were 30 because no one in your family valued college. That would be an example of niche picking. So you weren't able to develop your intelligence until you could independently make your own choices. Um, temperament, I kinda wanna hold off on talking about temperament because it's a really important concept, but temperament is, the, is one's ability to, um, if one's high energy and easy to, difficult to calm down or if they're a little bit more mellow and easy to calm down. And then there's also some evidence, I would add addiction into this. Um, addiction, there is a lot of evidence that says that, that addiction runs in families, that there's a genetic predisposition or biological vulnerability. But if you're never exposed to alcohol, are you ever gonna become an alcoholic? On the other hand, I'm going to passive correlation. If, you are, if you've inherited the biological tendency to be an alcoholic, you live in a home where parents are, you know, alcohols everywhere and they give you your first drink at 14, you might develop alcoholism. Um, you live in a, or, or reactive here, let's see, you are born with the tendency to overeat and your parents, uh, or maybe, oh, we'll use the alcohol one, you're born with the tendency to become an alcoholic and say maybe your parents never check up on you or never see and never don't even notice that you're drinking when you're 16 and 17 and 18. That maybe would be an example of reactive. And then the active niche picking is you've inherited the tendency, you've inherited the capacity to become an alcoholic. Uh, 
uh, no one in your family drinks and you don't you don't drink for the first time till you go off to college and lo and behold when you go off to college you become quite the alcoholic right so I, that's really a better example of how these three how the how the relationship between your genes and your environment that it's the environment or the idea is that the environment causes the behavior the genetics to behave in a certain way and i think i'm going to stop that right there and um okay figure out how to